Cool. All right. I think we're live. I don't know if anybody's here with us yet. Resource forum. Yeah. Be awesome. You pulled some off the forum. Sweet. All right. Good deal. Yeah. Hey, make sure you guys are, you know, talking with each other in the chat over there, getting to know each other. Networking is a big part of it. Definitely. Yeah, guys, this, uh, this, this isn't, uh, we don't want this to be about us. We want it to be about you. Well, us too, I guess. We want it to be about the industry. Everyone. Um, you know, Jordan and I are really passionate about, uh, you know, what we call elevating the industry together. So it's not Jordan and I elevating the industry. It is us collectively as a group, as an industry, uh, taking the industry to a different level and changing those percentages. Um, I've kind of estimated just based on conversations and things like that, that I've always looked at our industry as kind of the top 20% are kind of in a league by themselves as far as quality of operations, the product that's being produced, the facilities. And then I've always felt like there's another 20% that are maybe in that tier just below that, that are still really good operators. Um, and then unfortunately, I've seen a good 50 or 60% of the industry that is what, you know, Brian Grell calls the zombie mats. And uh, I, hey, we got a star joining us here. Hi. What's your name? Oh, here, she can't hear you. Oh. He said, what's your name? What's your name? Evangeline. 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 Holy cow. Yeah. That's an awesome name. <laughs> Welcome. You're you're a star. Future laundromat owner right here. Holy cow. <laughs> All right. Awesome. All right. Say bye. See ya, Angeline. <laughs> yeah, but anyway, I've always kind of felt, you know, I don't have any data to back this up. Just my personal opinion that our industry, as far as quality, is kind of broken down into three tiers in my mind. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a top tier, a, a sort of a middle tier. And unfortunately, I only see that as a good 30 or 40 percent of the industry. Um, and I see the other 50 to 60 percent of the industry as predominantly these zombie mats. And there's no doubt about it that the people that are in this forum right now are in those top two. They probably wouldn't be here uh, if they weren't or if they were, mm -hmm. if they weren't. Anyways. Um, yeah. So, I mean, what are your thoughts on that, Jordan? Yeah, no, I mean, I think you're right. And just from hosting the, the podcast, talking to a lot of those owners, talking to a lot of owners, uh, in general, you know, there, there's definitely, uh, tiers of owners and, you know, the goal I think that both of us have, and I think that a lot of people here have is for the majority of the industry to be in that top tier, right? Like, I don't like the 20% yeah. breakdown. I want it to be like a 95%, 100% in that top tier who are running their businesses well. And, but it's not easy to do, right? Yeah. And especially if you don't have, um, you know, networking connections with other, you know, people who've learned the hard lessons already. If you're learning them yourself, it's just so, you know, it's, it takes a long time and it costs a lot of money to learn lessons that way. So, yeah. Um, I think that's a big part of why we want to do this and we want to not just be, you know, here answering questions, but to also facilitate connections between owners who are us, but who also not just us. Right. Absolutely. We want to meet all you guys. Jordan and I want to get to know each other better. We want all you guys to meet each other in the comments. Um, you know, with technology, the way that it is nowadays, this is networking and it's effective, you know, mm -hmm. it's might not be the same as being at the clean show, but it is effective. And uh, so let's, you know, let's build relationships. Um, Jordan, I thought a good place to start. I feel like what I know about you, um, I don't know a ton about your beginnings in mm. the industry, but I know yeah. you've talked about them briefly and you've made comments and correct me if I'm wrong, um, that you and I may be overstating this, that you made a lot of expensive mistakes, painful mistakes. Um, you, part of your passion for laundry, laundry at resource is that you couldn't find the networking and the resources and 
things like Laundromat Resource Podcast, uh, mm-hmm. Laundromat Resource YouTube channel, um, those types of things. And I know I got in the industry 10 years ago and I couldn't find those. Um, and so that's a part of why I'm passionate. I think we had a little bit different journey because mine was actually rather smooth because I mm-hmm. found an amazing mentor, just complete dumb luck, which is why I want to try to be that for other people nowadays. Um, it's kind of where my passion comes, but can you, can you talk as little, as much as you're comfortable, can yeah. you talk about your start in the business and kind of where your passion comes from and whatever experiences you had that you want to share? Yeah. Uh, and I am paying attention. I'm just, there's questions coming in. So I'm making sure we get those written down. I know so I'm so trying to keep up already. Hey, Luke. hey, keep those, keep those questions coming and welcome uh, to all you guys who are just joining us. Crystal, what's up? How's it going? And Katie and Luke. Luke says, "Hey, pipe all your washers into into a trough." That's that's his big tip. And you know, Luke probably owns I don't know what, like 120 laundromats or something now. I think <laughs> it last... was I think it was 37 when he was on your podcast. So yeah, I think it's like 370. Yeah, right. Now. Well, I mean, I've I've already resigned to the fact that eventually Luke will own every laundromat in existence. That's just yeah. the pace that he's on. So there's um, a good chance. So when Luke's giving you advice, he says, you know, pipe it, pipe it into a yeah. trough. You know, you listen to that advice. So <laughs> thanks Luke. <laughs> Agreed. Luke you. knows his stuff. Yeah. Also, it looks like Brian Henderson, man, you might need to do a little Q and a yourself. There's questions coming in for <laughs> you. So, Hey, uh, let us know when that is. We'll be there. Um, yeah. Uh, Brian said he's going to try to derail us. Okay. Uh, <laughs> speaking of being derailed, I've already been derailed. Uh, keep those questions coming. We're going to get to them uh, quick on my entrance into the lawn med industry. Uh, essentially, I fell into what I uh, what I call a laundry mill, and what that is um, is I and I've seen this unfortunately happen a lot. Is there's laundromats that are they're never going to be great laundromats. They can be good laundromats. They're never going to be great laundromats, but they're way oversold by a broker. And um, the broker oversells it and gets somebody who's new and and sells them a laundromat and then uh, gets them to put all new equipment in because that's how the brokers get paid and, um, and, and gives them a promise. I got a pro forma that started at five turns a day and went up from there. And my laundromat yeah, has, that's never, yeah, has never touched uh five turns a day uh, that that location and uh but i was i was excited man i was gonna be rich in no time um but i ended up writing fifteen hundred dollar checks every single month as i lost money for a year and a half and uh it's just a really rough rough go and i didn't know where to turn i didn't know who to turn to i was part of the cla i was on the forums um but i just didn't know what to do and and so it was just a rough go so speaking of learning hard and expensive lessons the hard way i did that and you know part of why i started laundromat resources because i have all these very expensive lessons that i've learned um and i just feel like nobody has to learn those lessons the way i did because not only was it expensive but it was so stressful um, you know, when money is going out, when you, when you invest a lot of money in a business to make money and more money keeps going out every month, it's, it's just so stressful. Um, so that's kind of my, my entrance into the world of laundromats. What was your most, uh, painful lesson in your first few years? Cause it sounds like you had several and you yeah. can do financially or physically or yeah. however you want well, to that. I mean, the, the biggest lesson I learned, I mean, the, the, the painful lesson is, you know, when, especially when you're buying your first one, make sure you have somebody whose income doesn't depend on you buying a laundromat that knows the industry that can help you. So like my, my so I relied solely on this broker who I had to put all my trust in to, were they a distributor too? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it was, but I mean, I didn't know anybody else in the industry. Right. And so, and that was my fault. Like I probably shouldn't have got in the industry, but Hey, lesson learned. Right. But, but the big lesson is, you know, distributors can be an awesome resource Mm -hmm. uh, for you. Brokers can be an awesome resource for you, but I always recommend like find uh, another owner, find a consultant, find 
somebody who knows the industry that can help you get in. Because if you get in this industry right the first time, sky's the limit. You can yeah. you can build anything you want to build when you're making money, right? But if you get in wrong, it's just it can be so hard to dig yourself out of it. So yeah, yeah. Well, I uh, I mean I don't I'm not I'm not trying to brag because this isn't my doing, but I kind of had the other experience, to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I started in the industry. I, when I applied for my first best SBA loan um, to buy my first store, which was pretty small, I remember filling out all the, the paperwork, you know, miles and miles. And uh, I mean, my, I was 32 years old. My net worth was $60,000. And most of that was in my 401k a little equity in my house. I mean, I had a little bit sprinkled a couple of places, but I had basically working since I was 14 years old and I looked up at 32. And so that's 18 years. And, you know, yeah, I bought a house. I was basically just, I was in the, what do they call it? The, uh, the treadmill of life, mm -hmm. the rat race is what I'm thinking. Rat race. Yeah. I was in the rat race and I was working, paying my bills, working, paying my bills but I wasn't really in creating my, increasing my net worth. And that was part of what attracted me to the laundromat business or any business. And uh, I bought my first store and everything was on the up and up. Um, it, everything the owner told me was what it was. It was losing money, but I knew it when I bought it. Um, and it, it was the epitome of a zombie mat for sure. If Brian Grells joined us, um, and before I even closed on it, probably 60 days before I closed, I was interviewing equipment distributors and I talked to some bad ones, didn't have a good gut feeling, stumbled upon a, a phenomenal one in HM company, which is a equipment distributor for Hipsch for Alliance mm -hmm. here in Cincinnati. And they're a second generation equipment distributor. And so both of the brothers that owned it had inherited it from their dad. And they grew up in the business. They never knew anything but laundromats. Um, and one of them kind of was very passionate about, is very passionate about the laundry, the coin laundry sign. They also had an OPL cell. And uh, I mean, he just took me under his wing. He saw my passion. He saw I was willing to put in the work. And I didn't have any choice but to listen to him. I mean, I had a clue how to run a business but I certainly didn't know anything about laundromats. And to this day, he's my equipment distributor. He's now one of my best friends. Um, and if I had to point to one single resource that has made me successful, it would be him. Um, and so I didn't do everything right uh, by any means, but most of the lessons that I, you know, the punches in the face I took, were you know a few thousand dollar punches as opposed to a few hundred thousand dollar punches. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I had a very different experience, not that I haven't made mistakes, and it was primarily because of one single relationship, one soul um, just just gold distributor. And so you kind of had the other end of the spectrum. I don't know yeah. how you classify them as a distributor but it doesn't sound like it was a good situation. And I'm on the other end of the spectrum. And I talk all the time, and I know you do, Jordan, about how an equipment distributor, a good one, can be a gold mine, but how a bad one, and there's a lot of both out there. Um, I mean, you talk about on your podcast, you know, in your first, your first store, you need to hit a home run, mm -hmm. unless you're just independently wealthy. Uh, when you get into the business and I, I'll fully admit if I didn't hit a home run on my first one, you know, I don't know where I would have went. I wouldn't, where it would end up. So we, we both come at it from very different um, backgrounds as far as entering the industry. But I think we've both seen the same lessons mm -hmm. and gotten the same out of it. Um, you've just taken more bruises than, than yeah. I have. 
Go but Dave's I think route. It's better. What's that? I said, go your route. It's better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, the funny thing is, like, I didn't realize how spoiled I was for a good five years. Like, when I, when I started feeling like I had something to offer to the industry and I had something where I could help other people, um, then that's when I started reaching out. I didn't feel like a newbie anymore. I felt like somebody that had something to offer versus just – help me people. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. and, uh, it was, it was, I don't know. It was just a, a, a unique experience for me. And it sounds like it was for you too. Yeah, so unique, unique is a nice way to say it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't, I don't want to speak for you, but it sounds like it was, it sounds like we were at opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Um, well, hey, should sure. we jump into some of these questions? We got them. Yeah, right. absolutely. They're, they're coming in. So, yeah. Hey, if you guys should. have questions, you know, put them in there and I'm, I'm taking notes and writing them down and we'll try to get to as many as we can. Uh, Chris asks, Chris Lynn uh, asks, uh, where do you start when you want to open a laundromat? Uh, they, Chris wants to open a laundromat and wants to know where a good starting point is. Um, where to start? I think the first thing you have to do is look at your business acumen, your business experience and your financial situation. I think your capital situation is a big factor in where you start. Mm -hmm. And it was for me. Um, So I think you have to start there and see what are your capacities? What are your capabilities? Because if you are independently wealthy, um, that can be a good thing because the world is open to you as far as opportunities, but it can also be a really bad thing because it's an opportunity to make a million dollar mistakes. And if it's your cash on hand, nobody's mm-hmm. going to stop you. Nobody's going to tell you you can't do it. Um, so did I lose my feed? No, I think you're good. Okay. I see you. Uh, um, yeah, so that, I, that would be where I would start. I think it's a good point. Uh, the, the podcast episode that's coming out this next coming week, uh, the, the guest and I were talking and, he he was building his first one out, but his cost ended up being 80 grand more than budgeted um, out of pocket. And so I think that, you know, assessing your financial situation early on and uh, and what your plan is, is a huge, uh, a huge deal because costs can get you. And the worst thing in the world that can happen is you buy a laundromat or you build a laundromat or you open a laundromat and, you know, within the first six months, you run out of money and and that's it right like then you're then you're done right yeah. so you want to make sure you have that capital um i would say too you know obviously you want to be learning as much as you can there's tons of places to be learning uh that stuff you know dave yeah at laundromatmillionaire.com has stuff laundromatresource.com has stuff the cla has stuff yep. um there's a lot of other uh sites that have uh information so but you do also want to be careful who you're learning from yeah. and and always you know figuring out what experience do they have and what's their motivation for sharing that information because uh, that's a big deal um, but also on top of that you know i would say you need to start looking at laundromat for sale um, so whether it's even just googling laundromat for sale near me and start getting a feel for you know what numbers are going to be presented uh, to you how do you read a pro forma how do you read um, a financial sheet. Uh, how do you analyze a deal? How do you determine, you know, the health of the laundromat? How do you value a laundromat? Those things will be better if you practice them. Even on, you know, even if you can't find a laundromat for sale near you, just find one for sale, and and practice, um, practice figuring out how much you would offer on a laundromat, even if you don't have any intention of buying it. Um, I think that's a good place to start too. So I think we both agree that the distributor is important and valuable. Um, what what are a couple quick things that you look for, or you would tell a client to look for? In I, you know, I always tell people my clients to interview, mm-hmm. to sit down with, have lunch in person, face to face. Obviously, you know, one thing I would throw out there is to ask for a few referrals, mm-hmm. talk to people that have helped them be successful. Um, what, what, what would you say as far as how do you find a good distributor? 
Yeah, well, that's that's a good question. I get asked all the time, you know, do you have a, a list of distributors? Um, because yeah. people even have a hard time finding them. And I don't have a list, but I would like to make a list. So maybe I'll put yeah. that on my to-do list, making a list of distributors, because I think that would be helpful for one. Um, yeah. But I, I think your advice is good. You know, people will always let you know the best parts of themselves or the best parts of what they want you to think about them. Um, but getting references is a big deal because other people will let you know. And what, what I try to get a feel for is uh, their knowledge of the industry. And so asking them, you know, about their experience, their knowledge, you know, about the industry, because you want to take advice from people who know the industry. They don't necessarily have to be owners themselves, but, you know, you want them to know the industry. And I'm trying to get a feel for their integrity. And the reason for that is because you're going to be investing a lot of money with these people. Um, and so yeah. part of that is I always tell people, talk to multiple distributors from multiple brands. Even if you know what brand you want to go with, yep. meet some other ones, um, see what they have to say in terms of machine mix, in terms of price, all of that stuff. And it gives you just more data points to help you determine uh, if a particular distributor is someone you want to work with or not. Yeah. When it comes to looking for distributors, um, a couple things just come to mind for me. The CLA has resources. Um, I know at least once a year they put out like a distributors issue um, of the magazine, which is there's not a lot of articles and that kind of stuff in it. It's it's mostly distributors, you know, vendorite, vision vendors, different. I'm sure it's probably advertisers and members of the CLA. Um, but I don't think that's a bad place to start. I mean, not every distributor is associated with the CLA is a member and that doesn't make them a bad distributor. Um, but if they're active in the industry with an organization like CLA, I think that's a good sign, generally speaking. Um, another thing that I did early on that I didn't know any different was I, I drove about an hour and a half from my house and started just going into laundromats and seeing if the owners would talk to me. And mm -hmm. some of them booted me and some of them talked to me and they would tell me about their distributor. And I figured, well, I'm far enough away from home where if I tell them where I'm looking to buy a laundromat, then they're not going to feel threatened by me. Um, and that, I guess I was kind of naive, <laughs> naive because uh, some of them didn't believe me, but I, I did get pointed in the right direction with a few local distributors in Cincinnati and I was able to talk to them. Um, but I do think that there's more resources now, uh, especially digitally speaking, uh, mm -hmm. distributor lists and things like that than there was 10 years ago. And I'm sure there was before that. And then the other thing is I know if you contact the manufacturers um, themselves, that they will tell you who the local distributor is that services your area. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, if you contact Alliance, tell them you're in Cincinnati, they're going to tell you who their speed queen and hips distributor is. And I'm sure it's the same for Dexter and continental and mm -hmm. all the different companies. Um, so I, I think that's a good place to start. Yeah. So yeah. I've I'm got a few, I've got a few questions here that, mm -hmm. uh, that were sent to me. Um, one of them I think is interesting, but this, this question comes up all the time. Uh, Taylor Hawkins sent this to me. He says, how do you control access to your bathroom if you aren't attended? Now, are you yeah. attended, unattended? I have, I have one attended, one attended, and I'll tell you exactly how I dealt with that issue okay. in my unattended one. I shut it down. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm lucky enough that I'm in a, a shopping center with a grocery store. There's other bathroom options. It's a little tougher okay. to do, but you know, my my unattended laundromat is in an area where I just I could not control, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people coming in and out of that bathroom. Even if I charged money, didn't matter. People would yep. go in there and sleep, or they, you know, shower in the sink, or they'd go do drugs in there. Um, and it was just, it was too hard to control. So I ended up having to shut mine down. So 
I don't know the answer to that, but somebody, mm -hmm. if you have a good answer to that, you know, I, I wanted to say too, like, this is a Q and a with us, but mm -hmm. you guys can answer each other's questions in the, yep. and I see you guys are doing that already. Yep. Um, there's been a ton of good advice in the, in the comments too. So keep that, keep mm -hmm. that rolling too. So that's how so I a few things I've done with that. Cause when I started in the business, my first two stores were unattended, uh, pretty much a hundred percent other than cleaning. And they were both open 24 hours. Now we weren't mm -hmm. in LA. I mean, we were on the east side of Cincinnati, um, which is just the suburbs. But we still had a lot of problems. I think drugs are everywhere. Um, I'm sure they're worse in where you are. But um, we had the problems you described. And I am a very stubborn person. And so mm -hmm. I would do things as drastic as set my alarm for 3 a.m. and drive up to the store. <laughs> Mm -hmm. and see if anyone was sleeping in my bathroom, especially mm -hmm. if I was going after a certain person that I had been trying to get out of there. Um, I also contacted the local police department and took them in a big tray of cookies and met with the chief and told him who I was and what I was wanting to do. Mm -hmm. And I was wanting to clean up this laundromat, which was kind of a cesspool for the community, which is a problem for the police. Mm -hmm. And I kind of befriended them and said, you know, I want to turn this around and make it a community asset versus um, a cesspool. And they agreed to have their night officers um, sit in my parking lot if they were doing paperwork or if it was a slow night. And that actually helped quite a bit. But ultimately, part of my decision for eventually transitioning from unattended two fully attended stores was that mm -hmm. because there really isn't an answer before we stopped going. We're not 24 hours anymore. There is, um, there is an answer. It's been in, in the chat. Brian okay. Henderson has the answer and Brian, it's building a self-cleaning bathroom that hoses itself down. So <laughs> <laughs> every hour on the hour, the sprinklers go off, whether someone's in there or not, it's going off. <laughs> That'll keep wow. from sleeping in there. Yeah. Luke also says, Hey, keep them open during the day, shut them down at night. So that's a yep. good idea too. That's what I was just getting ready to say is during that transition. That's one of the things I did was I started having my evening attendant cleaning person lock the bathroom at 9 PM. And when they came in at 9 AM, they would open it and they were only there for a couple hours in the morning and the evening, but they would leave it open during the daytime hours and mm -hmm. close it at night, lock it overnight. And I caught a lot of flack for it, but it worked. Um, so I do think that's, that's, uh, good stuff. Melissa's really wanting somebody to suggest security cameras in the bathroom. I, I don't think anybody really wants to see that. So well, I tell you what, Melissa, at one point I was so frustrated. I actually <laughs> looked into whether that's legal and I knew the answer yeah. <laughs> and it's not, but I was desperate. Um, so yeah, for whatever that's worth. Yeah, I'm, so, I'm all for the self hosing down bathroom idea. Yeah. So somebody get on that and I'll, I'll invest in it. I'm with you, you know what, if you want someone creative to problem solve, Brian Henderson is the man. Yeah, that's right. Might be, <laughs> might be worth just hiring an attendant at that point. So, but, yeah, well, and uh, we, that's part of what we did. We transitioned from unattended to attended. And that was one of the many reasons um, was because of that. So it's yeah. a nightmare for our industry and there isn't really an easy answer. Yeah. It just kind of comes with the turf. Well, yeah. uh, I want to get to this question, but not yet, but there were a couple of people when I was sharing my story who mentioned that they're in the similar boat where money's mm -hmm. going out and I just not, not mm -hmm. yet, but I think we should actually address that and try to give some strategies to help turn that around uh, for those people, because I've been in that situation and it, it can feel super desperate. So we should definitely do yes. that. Um, but somebody had a question of, uh, how, how to find commercial customers. I'm assuming you pick up and delivery customers now, like during COVID times. Mm. Um, I think pretty much across the industry from what I'm hearing is residential pickup and delivery is actually doing pretty well, but commercial mm. obviously is struggling and, um, and a big part of that obviously is because a lot of businesses are either not open or they're not open to the same capacity. And a lot of the industries that would utilize that service have been hit the hardest, like 
hospitality, like restaurants, yep. those kinds of things. So, but any, any ideas, any tips on picking up commercial accounts? Well, Mr. right now, Nest? right now in the unique environment that we're in, I, and I don't say this very often, I don't think there's much you can do yeah. because this is literally a once in a lifetime. I don't know, definitely in my lifetime, a uh, situation where businesses are literally being closed collectively across the industry or across the country. Mm -hmm. And if they don't have business, they're in nothing to do. And they're definitely struggling financially. The ones that do have a little bit of laundry, you know, a lot of times those owners who maybe didn't used to work full time in the, in the restaurant or whatever now are again, just, as a means of survival. And so I, you know, a lot of, a lot of our commercial clients, which we don't do big commercial, we just do light commercial. A lot of them are hair salons, nail salons, mm -hmm. chiropractors. And they've basically told us business is down 50, 70, 80%. What I do have, I'm just going to take home and yeah. wash myself. Yeah. Because they are just trying to survive. Yeah. They're looking so, for to save the money too. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's a unique situation and we'll eventually come out the other side of that, mm -hmm. but we don't know when that's going to be. So what I would tell you in the meantime is, you know, take the path of least resistance because laundry pickup and delivery for residential is booming like never before. Yeah. And it's going to continue for the next 20 years until we reach I really believe laundry pickup and delivery for residential customers is going to become the oil change of 30 years ago. Um, you know, where I don't know anybody that changes their own now. Yeah. But they, it used to be common. And there was a time where some people did, some people didn't. It was a gradual process. But now no one really does that. And I, I'm a firm believer that that's going to be an evolution over time of how we live our lives. And I'm not saying self-serve is ever going to go away, but I do think that it's the tip of the iceberg. And so why not, you know, why fight that? Why, why go after business that isn't there, that doesn't exist? Why not go after the low lying fruit, especially when it's just fallen off the trees and rotten because there's so much business there that nobody's doing it. Yeah. So that, that would be my answer. And I don't, I don't give up easily. <laughs> Yeah. But, uh, but I think but I wouldn't mess with it. Yeah, I think you're right. I think there's a lot of low hanging, you know, relatively low hanging fruit in the residential right now. Ross Dodds. What's up, Ross? How's it going? Hey, man? Ross. Uh, he had a suggestion to look for medical like Botox, like plastic surgery facilities, those kinds of things. You know, thinking about right now who is doing business and going after those if you want to go after those commercial accounts. But like you're saying, there's, you know, there's a low hanging fruit in the, in the residential right now. Um, and yeah, some areas will be slower, you know, Casey was saying it's slow right now. Some areas will be slower to adapt or adopt, I guess that, um, than others. But I, I just think there's only upside for a long time to come right now. If that's something that you're interested in now, that is a different business model no than doubt. a self-service laundry and a different customer base. So, yep. you know, I literally just had a conversation with Luke Williford the other day about pickup and delivery. Mm -hmm. And he was kind of asking and picking my brain a little bit. And that was one of the things I told him was there's no doubt the business is there. Um, a lot of people are trying it and they're failing at the execution side, which is a different business, as you said. And you can't treat it as drop off or self serve as you scale. At first, you can for a few months. But as you scale, you have to be in a situation where your, your operations are ahead of the growth that's coming. And so there's that side of it that is really important to look at. But what you said, really nothing's more true than that, is it doesn't matter how much business is there and how much money there is to make. Do you mm -hmm. want to do that? Is that what you want your business to be? Because I really believe that one of the best things about being an entrepreneur is that we get to choose what we do and what we don't do. No one can come in and tell me how to run my business. Nobody can tell you how to run your business. 
we get to decide that for ourselves. And so I think you have to decide if that's a part of the business you want to be in. And that's I think what, what uh, Luke is, you know, self-assessing right now. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people are, um, but yeah. there's no doubt the opportunity is there. Yeah. Well, while we're talking about pickup and delivery real quick, uh, you know, Bob was asking, what are, uh, what are some of the best practices to get pickup and delivery customers? If there is, you know, if there's upside in the residential, how do you get them? How do you find them? How do they find you? Digital and digital. You got to do digital marketing, but something that I feel incredibly passionate about is way too many of us, many of us in the industry try to DIY our marketing. And that worked 30 years ago with flyers and signs on your awning. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying not to do those things, mm-hmm. but this is a different world. Mm-hmm. And in my opinion, one of the worst things that we as small business owners can do is DIY digital marketing. Mm-hmm. I actually believe that in most cases, you're better off not doing digital marketing than you are doing it yourself, unless that's your full-time gig. That's what you're trained to do. And the reason that I believe that is it's so easy to lose money. Like there's so many people out there doing DIY digital marketing and they think they're successful, but they don't realize that their cost of acquisition might be $60 or $160. Mm-hmm. And they don't know, they don't know how to read analytics and they don't, you know, these algorithms with all these companies change daily. And I really firmly believe that you need to find it in your budget to hire a professional digital marketing company. And I recommend to my clients and anyone that will listen to find one that focuses on our industry. Mm-hmm. that specializes in laundromats, drop off, um, and pick up and deliver. And obviously in a best case scenario, your organization grows where you can bring in a digital marketing person in house, like that organization happiness that I'm a part of. We have in-house digital marketing people that do our digital marketing for us, but it's a f- fairly big organization. We're growing. So, I mean, most individual laundromats aren't going to hire a full-time digital marketing person, Mm -hmm. but find someone like, I mean, I know you guys do digital marketing, right? And you're through resource marketing. Yep. Yeah. So, I mean, plug that, tell them, tell them, what do you think? Why, you know? Yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, I think you're, you're dead on, on the digital marketing because that's the clientele that you're really looking for when it comes to pickup and delivery, you know, somebody who's going to be mostly who's going to be you know, somebody who's tech savvy, somebody who's on Facebook, somebody who's searching for that on Google. Uh, you know, Erwin asked if stapling flyers on polls still works. Of course, man. I mean, you think any exposure is good, but you're not going to get a lot of bang for your buck with that. You're not going to get a lot of customers, but you know, being seen is, is good. But the people who are going to see flyers stapled, stapled on polls are more likely going to be your self-service customers. The people who you want to adopt your pickup delivery services, you can really target them through things like Facebook advertising, through Google, you know, advertising, AdWords. Um, you can really target the correct demographics in the correct way to really, you know, get a lot of bang for your buck instead of doing shotgun, you know blast trying to find customers you can be a little bit more of a sniper by finding the kind of people who would use your pickup and delivery service and pay a little extra so that they don't have to do their laundry because that's who you really need well something i really (laughs) passionately believe too but wait hold on because luke Luke, who owns like a million he knows he knows but he he says stand on the corner with a sign and just do something but He's joking, but he's also serious. He's like, you know, do something, right? Like Street you can't just corner, expect creature. people to to show up. So he's like, do something, but but you're right. Like uh targeted ads is is the way to go for this, I think. Well, there's guerrilla marketing, which is what a lot of us did in the beginning. Mm-hmm. Um, 
There's a book out there by Seth Godin called Purple Cow. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've read that. Um, Read that book. It's phenomenal. It's not about the laundromat industry. It's about marketing, but it talks about market differentiators. And it talks about, you know, purple cow doesn't exist. So if it did exist, it would stand out. Mm-hmm. And you want to find ways to stand out. So you can do those things guerrilla marketing wise, or you can do them more uh, professional ways, depending on your budget. But what I really wanted to say was one of the things I've learned is the reason I tell people not to do DIY digital marketing is because I've learned that if you have a budget of five, six, seven hundred, a thousand dollars a month to market, that you're actually better off paying an agency three, four, five hundred bucks for their services because they can make your other five hundred dollars in your budget in ad spend go further and be more effective than you could with a thousand dollar ad spend. They're just pros. They're they're good at what they do, and they can get your cost of acquisition, excuse me, acquisition so low that they actually pay for their fees. So something I'm also really passionate about is don't see marketing as an expense. See it as an investment. Investment, yeah. And you've yeah. got to hire the pros and build it into your budget. If your budget is a thousand dollars then you have less of an ad spend because you got to pay a professional to do the marketing. And I'm really passionate about that because I've tried the other ways and I'm pretty passionate about digging in and trying to learn things. And it's a losing battle unless you want to do that 40 hours a week. Just hire a pro, tell them your goals, tell them your budgets and get out of their daggone way and worry about operations. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to say, Deborah, we're going to hit your question here pretty soon. She's got a, um, she's got a competitor. It's actually a big distributor in Southern California mm-hmm. here who put in uh, an attended, fully attended free dry laundromat across the street, basically. Um, and that's a scary thing, especially when it's a local distributor doing it. Um, and and hers is unattended so uh so let's talk about that in a second but uh man i forgot to write it down somebody asked about uh ozone oh casey casey asked about ozone Mm -hmm. and i know you just put that in right i did yeah can you tell us a little bit about that yeah i'm a big believer i did a lot of research on ozone the technology and then ozone there's two delivery systems um brands, if you will, that serve our industry. And I chose Santa Wash, which is the company we use for ozone. And, you know, I don't have any experience with the other company. I don't have anything good or bad to say about them, but really the technology has been around for years and years in the hospitality industry. And what's happened is over the last, I don't know, four or five years, these companies have kind of fine tuned and per- perfected um, the delivery systems that deliver it to your cold water wild valve. And they've, um, they've revolutionized our industry because the technology has been there, but the delivery system wasn't mm-hmm. to go from one ozone machine to 37 washers without overproducing, because if you overproduce, it can damage the machine. It can, you know, make you sick, make your customers sick inside the store and things like that. But I did a lot of research, learned a lot and really found that the technology is legit. It does work. It is a market differentiator in every way. And so we put it into one of our stores and we waited about four months before we did any marketing or anything like that. Even didn't put a banner up in our store. We just had a little sign by the machine and that's it. And we could tell a difference. Our employees could tell a difference. Our customers could tell a difference. And that was the proof in the pudding. And so now I'm in the process of ramping up the marketing to really tell the world that 
we're the only sanitizing laundromat in Cincinnati right now. Yeah. And so we had a couple commercials made. Um, I've been sharing those on my YouTube channel and stuff like that. You can see those there. Um, I hire a, a professional um, Good investment. creative agency. Yes, definitely. But I didn't jump into it quickly. I mean, I did my homework. And one of the things that I learned is when I talked to friends that already had ozone is that putting it in isn't enough. You got to market it. I mean, it's a differentiator, but you got to market it to your community and let them know that you have something that your competitors don't have. And so that's what they're in the pro we're in the process of doing right now. So it does, um, Stacy had commented earlier in the comments um, about a smell in her drains and her mm -hmm. troughs and treatment. Stacy, um, I had the same problem in my store, the store you visited. Stacy's a client of mine, the store you visited and it smelled awful and our machines were brand new. We had our pit and our lines jetted every year. We even tried every six months and it didn't matter. We put ozone in, the problem went away. So it's powerful from the laundry and being more effective at cleaning, but it's also really effective in just the overall environment of your store and the smell. Um, it's powerful stuff. Awesome. 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 Well, hey, way back in the beginning, Carlos asked about eco laundromats and I'm not sure what exactly the specific question is, but I'm, I'm wondering if maybe he's wondering if this is a direction to go with your laundromat um, or, uh, oh, he just commented. Sorry, I missed some of this. Uh, oh, he's asking if this is the eco conversation. So uh, yeah, I don't know. We have anything to say about eco laundromats? Uh, I know that um, episode three of the laundromat resource podcast, um, Toby, who's out in Australia came on and he built uh, an eco friendly uh, laundromat. So, I mean, obviously anything we can do for uh, our planet is good, but I don't know. You have anything to say about eco laundromats? Well, um, I think the natural process of modernizing older laundromats, building mm -hmm. new laundromats, doing it in phases, is is doing that either slowly overnight whether you build a brand new store or whatever because what we're learning is it's really about the equipment and the the manufacturers of the equipment for our industry that they've come so far in making this equipment energy efficient and one of the things that i tell my clients all the time is a new equipment will almost always pay for itself if you're comparing it to 10 or 15 year old equipment mm -hmm. or older. Um, and a part of that is increased revenue, you know, raising your prices when you put new equipment in. Um, part of it is like in the shiny stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I, you know, Bob, we've been talking about that. Uh, Bob is one of my clients, Bob Beck. And, uh, We've been talking about that because he's new to the industry and he was mm -hmm. floored to hear that in almost all cases, new equipment will pay for itself and increase VEN price and lower utility costs. And by the time you factor those two things in, especially if you're financing the equipment, it will almost always cover the note plus some. Um, and so you end up with a healthier business and now you have a market differentiator. Because even if you have a laundromat up the road that has five-year-old equipment, you have something they don't have. You have brand new equipment. It's only brand new once, but take advantage of that. So I really believe that when it comes to the eco-friendly laundromat, those, a lot of these things are happening organically across our industry. And a lot of it is thanks to the manufacturers mm -hmm. and their processes and them seeing how they can help us as owners revolutionize the industry and what better situation than when we can elevate the industry, the quality of our product 
and lower the footprint. I mean, how do we lose? Yeah. A lot more perks are rolling in in the comments section too. So if you're looking for perks, perks, check perks. Yeah. Check out those perks in the comments section. Uh, I can't even keep up. Yeah. This is phenomenal. You guys. It's awesome. And you guys are, you guys are chipping in on the, on the answers, which is awesome. Yep. Uh, Stacey wanted to know if she should wait for a, a retool before putting in ozone uh, and if she should do it while she's doing the retool or if she should do it now, does that create complications? You got any thoughts on that? I don't know that I know the answer to that. Yeah, the uh, installation process for ozone is actually similar to taking a brand new car that hasn't been tuned up, a new engine for lack of a better term, and tuning it up because it, the installation is a very finicky process to get it dialed in just right. So if you plan to purchase new equipment in the next year, I would do it either at the same time or after. I wouldn't do it before. Um, but I'm not sure how far this equipment project you're talking about. If it's two machines, I'm not saying to wait. But if you're talking about a complete retool, I would absolutely do it at the same time. And I definitely wouldn't do it ahead of time. Yeah. Okay. She says it's, she's probably doing it late 2021, early 2022. So yeah, sounds like good, yeah. good time. Good time to wait. Yeah. A year I would wait. Yeah. Uh, cool. Okay. Well maybe we should tackle, um, you know, Casey and Bob both said, Hey, you know what? Money is going out right now. I'm in that, I'm in that time when, you know, it's, I'm not making money. I'm losing money every month. Yeah. Maybe we can, maybe we can give some strategies on how to help turn that around and get them pointed in the right direction. Yeah. So you were losing money when you got in the business. Mm -hmm. I was too. I mean, I expected it. I knew it was coming. You didn't, I think. Mm -hmm. What did you do? Curled up in a ball and cried for a while. Uh, well, I, I mean, I genuinely, I felt like I got punched in the gut. I didn't like, yeah. I didn't know because yeah, I was told I was going to be making tons of money. Um, and then it lasted so long. I think partially it lasted so long because I got paralyzed. I didn't know what to do because uh, money was just going out. Um, but I think that you kind of have a choice, right? I think your choice is to bail, which is what a lot of people do. And that's what I was talking about with the laundry mill. So what I'm seeing is brokers selling these laundromats, kind of overselling them and people run them for a year or two, find out it's not really what they wanted, uh, what they expected and go back to the broker and say, Hey, I need to get rid of it. So they'll go and sell it. Um, but and you know, to, to the next person and they just keep turning them over like that. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, but I do think that's one option is to just kind of bail and just cut your losses and, you know, either start over or do something different. Um, the other option is you, you got to buckle down and, you know, you probably got into the industry because you heard it was relatively low effort, um, relatively passive as a business, you can do it as a side gig. But when you find yourself in that situation, a lot of times you got to buckle down and just mm -hmm. if you determine that this is you're going to make it work, then you got to make it work. And it's going to take a lot more time and effort yep. um, to to turn things around. And so whether that's you being in there cleaning and spending more hours there and rehabbing stuff or whether that's you going door to door to, you know, try to get people into your laundromat or whatever the case may be, it's you know, you got to buckle down and, and put in the extra effort early because this industry can be relatively passive, but for a lot of people, it's, you know, especially if you're getting in into one that is maybe needs a little work or something, you got to put in effort up front. And then once things kind of get established and settled in a rhythm, then you can start, uh, you know, backing off your time commitment. So, mm -hmm that that's a big thing. Um, so, you know, some very practical, uh, very basic things is make sure you keep all your machines running, make sure you keep your change machines. If it's a coin store, make sure you keep those filled and which can be difficult to do, uh, sometimes in some locations, cause a lot of money, 
you know, walks out the door, especially if it's unattended. Um, you know, a lot of coins, not money, but coins walk out the door, but keep those things full and keep the store as clean as possible. Um, it's again, if it's unattended, it can be hard to do, but you know, maybe split your attendance time a little bit, have them come in in the morning, do a deep clean, and then come in a little later in the evening and do, you know, spot mopping and picking stuff up off the, off the ground for 15 or 20 minutes, just to kind of keep things clean. Um, if you need to, but or you spend more time there keeping it clean. Um, and then the other thing that I would really recommend is while you're spending time, a little more time at your laundromat, talk to customers, see what the word on the street is, see how people are thinking about your laundromat, how people see it. Do they see it as a place where homeless people are hanging out or do they see it, you know, as a safe place to come do laundry? Um, <clears throat> you know, there's no better way to find out how to get more customers than to ask your customers and the rest of the community what they think about your laundromat and then make changes accordingly. What do you got? Yeah, I couldn't agree more. you got to realize that this industry can be semi-passive and it's possible to, you know, buy into the industry in a good situation and operate from day one, you know, semi-passive or, even mostly passive in a perfect scenario. But if you've bought a laundromat that's losing money, even if you knew it, like I did, mm -hmm. you're not in that ideal situation. Right. Like you better buckle up. Mm -hmm. You better be ready to grind. And if you weren't, then you should have never been an entrepreneur because you could even buy into a perfect situation. Um, a perfect situation, but no guarantee it's going to stay that way. What if we have a pandemic someday? <laughs> yeah. I mean, that could never happen. <laughs> never. I mean, when you're in the situation we're in and you do what we do for a living, I don't care if it's a restaurant or what you got to be willing to do whatever it takes at any moment's notice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm in a pretty great situation right now as far as lifestyle and how I spend my time. I've got an army of people that are just rock stars, but I am not under any illusion that that couldn't change mm -hmm. tomorrow. And so you, you got to get it through your head that if you're an entrepreneur, you're a problem solver. And just because you don't have any problems today, don't mean you won't have them tomorrow. So you got to be willing to do whatever has to be done at any time. And I think that's a really good way of diagnosing whether you should tap out or not. Because mm -hmm. if you're not willing to do that, it's just going to get worse. Like, don't be under the delusion that you're going to pull out of this by just, you know, coasting. Just owning it for six months, nothing's going to change. You got to dig and dig hard. You got to make investment. Sometimes you got to double down on your risk which talk about getting punched in the stomach. Mm -hmm. I mean, what's worse than being punched in the stomach once? Getting punched in the stomach twice. Twice, yep. three times. So, I mean, what are you going to do with that? You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, you, you know, if you keep doing what you've always done, you're going to keep getting what you've always got. So if yeah. you're getting, and, and kind of coupled with uh, your your life, your situation is perfectly suited for the decisions that you've made in your life, right? So if you, uh, you know, if you don't like where you're at in your business right now, it means you need to do something different. And I think that a lot of us get sold on, I saw somebody laughing at the passive, Casey was laughing at the passive uh, comment, but that's, that's how this industry is sold, right? It's been sold mm -hmm. that way for a, a long time. And, you know, most of us who, who own laundromats know better. Um, but you know, at the same time, a lot of very successful owners don't spend 40 hours a week at yep. their laundromats. Um, and it's easy to see that part of it. It's cause not that many people are sharing that early on. A lot of us spent a lot of time yep. struggling through building our business. We spent, we mopped floors. We, you know, wiped down the machines. We yep. cleaned out lint traps. You know, we kicked out homeless people, you know, all these things like 
you know, we did them all and you got to do it to a point and build to a point where it can become more passive. Um, Cause it can be more passive where you're spending five, 10 or even less hours a week doing laundromat stuff, especially if you get good people on board and a good manager. Uh, but most of us, unless you got the money to just go out and buy, you know, a turnkey laundromat, a lot of us don't have that luxury. And so you're going to have to grind. And if you want something different for your business, you're going to have to do something different and, and make it happen. So, yeah, I mean, I'm living proof that it can be a semi-passive business and I'm not the only one, but like I said, I grinded for years and was very intentional about building the organization and I'm under no illusion that couldn't change. So, I mean, I'm always grinding, but now I don't have to grind every day. I can just get up some days and do what I want to do, mm -hmm. like do a free Q and a, <laughs> yeah, so it can exactly. be done. And I'm pretty passionate about telling people my story and telling them that, you know, there is this bill of goods that's sold about the laundromat industry being passive. And in a lot of cases, it is a bill of goods and it's not as easy or simple as it's made out to be. But I mean, I run a passive business, but I have 40 employees. Mm -hmm. So just because I'm not doing the work doesn't mean someone isn't. Mm -hmm. So if you're not going to do the work as the owner, you better find the revenue and find the margins to hire, train, and maintain good people to, to build an organization that you constantly reinvest in so that you can slowly over time back away from the day-to-day -day operations of your business. But I'm pretty passionate about coming at it from the other side of this industry and saying, no, 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 no. I'm not going to let people go around saying it's not possible. It's hard, but it is possible because I live it. Right. And it's part of why I'm telling my story. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the key is you, it, that, that just doesn't happen. You have to build nope. the structure for that. And, you know, Brian Henderson, he's got a couple comments here, but one was saying his dad had a cot in the office because he was spending yep. 16 hours a day at the store. And, yep. uh, but uh, he, he says, Hey, tell us about your organization structure. So you say you have 40 employees and you got multiple locations. So how yep. is that structured? Yeah. So we have four stores. Uh, each store has, uh, <clears throat> three to five usually part-time attendance. Each store has a store manager that they report to. Um, our biggest primary store is where we run our pick and uh, pick up and delivery out of. And it has a store manager, which is also our GM. And our other store managers report to my general manager at our primary store, whatever you want to call mm -hmm. it. And she manages that store the other managers report to her and then she manages about half of the 40 employees at that store because we have anywhere from seven to eight full-time laundry processors that only do pickup and delivery processing. They're not attendants. Mm -hmm. That store also has store attendants that report to Marlene, our GM. And we have anywhere from seven to eight uh, delivery drivers that you know, we have three, three trucks right now and they all report to our GM too. But over time we've added additional layers of management. So our third shift production crew that processes our happiness uh, delivery laundry overnight, they have two supervisors and one of them is always on duty. Um, a lot of nights they're both there. And so they the production people report to the supervisors on, on shift and the supervisors report to the GM, which is also the store manager. And then our delivery drivers, we have a very simple or a very similar process where we have delivery drivers that report to a supervisor 
and he's responsible for all the fleet management, changing the truck tires, getting oil changes. Somebody backs into a sign and busts the tail light, got to get it fixed, um, getting you know oil changes or whatever. He's responsible for all of that. And then he does the driver's schedule, but he reports to Marlene, my general manager. And so that's my uh, management system. And we actually just promoted one of our store managers to an assistant GM. And so as we continue to grow out our business, to build out our business, um, we're actually outgrowing one GM. And that's a great problem. Because yeah. I can just keep elevating her and her responsibilities and building a team of rock stars around her. Mm-hmm. And no one other than me in the organization is capable of doing every aspect of Marlene's job. But there's a team of people at my organization that collectively can do every aspect of her job. So we're big believers in operationally having our processors, or I'm sorry, our processes, and then having backups for everything, for every step of the process, having a backup already in place. Everybody knows what it is. And then we take it to another level because I'm obsessive and we have a backup for every backup. And it wasn't always this way. Mm -hmm. Like we're talking in the last couple of years, have I really gotten to that level? Mm -hmm. It took eight years of grinding and keeping my lifestyle where it was 10 years ago and reinvesting. And constantly what I hear is I want what Dave has, but I don't want to do what Dave did to get there. Mm-hmm. So part of my story is the first five to six years, I worked anywhere from 90 to 100 hours a week. I was a terrible dad, quite frankly, but me and my wife sat down and made the decision collectively as a family unit that this is what we are going to do. And she took care of the kids and raised the family and she had her own career. She wasn't mm-hmm. a stay at home mom. And so that was part of her, you know, story. She's part of this plan that was all very intentional because I worked and slept for five and a half years. And then I eventually was able to quit my full-time job. And then I worked 60 hours a week full-time in my business, but I didn't have to work the other 40 at my job anymore. Mm -hmm. And That's when my business skyrocketed. But during this entire journey, we never increased our lifestyle. Our revenue kept going up and up and up. And we would either reinvest it in new stores or reinvest it in people, layers mm-hmm. of management to get to where we are now. So awesome. I don't know if I overspoke that, but I get asked that question all the time. And that's how I did it. That's all I know to do is tell people my story. Yeah. How did I do it? Well, people don't like to hear that because I mean, we're yeah. hundred hours a week is nobody wants to do that, but that's, that, that's the recipe, right? Like that, the recipe yeah. is you do what you have to do until you don't have to do it anymore. And then you can hire people to do it or you can hire processes or systems and, and put those into place. Um, so Stacy wants to know, are your managers only managers? Are they only working as managers? Or are they also functioning as attendants? Yeah, they function as attendants in the store. So our stores are open 7 a.m. to 10 p.m., seven days a week other than holidays. And um, our store managers work 40 hours a week in the store. And when they work, other than a 15-minute overlap between them and a night attendant, they are the attendant of the store. Mm -hmm. Generally speaking, they work usually Monday through Friday, nine to five type Mm -hmm. of, it's part of the perk of their job, but they are willing to work evenings and weekends. And they understand just like me as an entrepreneur, they understand that nine to five is the best case scenario. 
but that at any moment they could be working weekends and nights depending on staffing. Yeah. And so they're empowered to interview, hire and fire their own people. And I've trained them to do that. It didn't happen by accident, but they're now empowered, but it falls on them. If they don't do a good job and they don't train the right people and hire the right people and get rid of the right people, then it's going to affect their lifestyle (laughs) because they're going to be working evenings and weekends. So they're directly incentivized. Mm -hmm. Um, But yeah, they, I mean, I would estimate my store managers other than my GM. I would estimate my store managers probably spend 20 to 25 hours a week being an attendant. And they probably spend 15 to 20 hours a week being a manager. But a lot of those things overlap. Mm -hmm. Um, So I don't know if that makes sense, but. Yeah. uh, Awesome. I mean, yeah, just really awesome. uh, Awesome input. I, I wanted to just pause for a second on the question. Keep the questions coming in. And if we miss a question, if we, I'm trying to keep up with them all, but if we miss one, just put it in the comments multiple times. It's fine. You're not going to offend us. Um, we'll make sure we'll try to get to it. But also just kind of wanted to tease at the end. We're, we're actually going to do this again. We're, we're just pumped about it. And so just wanted to let you know that at the end, we'll tell you when the next one will be. And I'm sure you'll see it popping up around yep. Facebook groups and on the podcast and, on our YouTubes and stuff. Um, speaking of which, make sure you go check out uh, both of our YouTube channels. Laundromat Millionaire has a YouTube channel. Uh, Laundromat Resource has a YouTube channel. There's content on there uh, to help you uh, grow in this industry and uh, just a place to, another place to kind of gather as a community. So uh, we're always trying to provide places to connect and to grow. And so that's just another place that you can do that. Um, so let's see what other questions we have. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. Yeah, yeah. So I got a question from Sam. Uh, hopefully Sam's still with us. He sent this to me ahead of time. He said, is this a good time to take a loan and invest in another laundromat? I will need to finance 80%. So his question is, I guess not really should he buy a laundromat, but should he buy one right now is now a good time. Yeah. Well, I just had um, Mark Stern from you know Eastern Funding on the podcast and he pretty much filled like an hour. Was Great that? interview. You guys yeah. need to watch that. Um, a, he's like an executive VP. Executive at VP. Finance. Yeah. Head of financing at Eastern Funding, which is kind of the behemoth of the <laughs> lenders, one of the, one of the big ones in the industry. And he pretty much spent an hour straight of, of like, telling you why now is a really great time to get a loan for a laundromat or for new equipment. Um, he, and, in I mean, he's just, he's just a solid guy. That was a really great interview. You should definitely check that out. Um, I'll look up what episode, I think it was episode 31, mm-hmm. I think, um, 30, 31, somewhere in there. Uh, so make sure you check that one out if you haven't, but yeah, I, I would say now's a great, there's a lot of, I mean, interest rates obviously are super low kind of across the board. There's a lot, everybody's looking for business right now. So there's a lot of people, uh, of lenders who are offering products that aren't offered all the time, um, loan products. And on top of that, um, you know, there's, there's some wheeling and dealing to be done. If you're looking for equipment, everybody's trying to keep their businesses afloat. So, you know, they're willing to negotiate price terms. Uh, he, ha- he gives some, Mark gives some really great tips on, Um, negotiating with like distributors, uh, negotiating with landlords, um, just a great time to be doing all that stuff. So, uh, Jordan, it's a great time to negotiate a lease and it's a great time to buy a commercial property. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's going to get better for a little bit too. I agree. I agree. But I'm also not one to try to time the market. (laughs) Um, but yeah, now is a great time in my opinion but it's all predicated on having um, the right information. There's never a bad time to get into business unless you're not prepared. And so a big part of why me and Jordan do what we do with consulting is because we've, I have clients, I'm guessing you have that have bought that 
$500,000 laundromat for or hundred thousand dollar laundromat for five hundred thousand mm-hmm. dollars, and it's brutal. I mean, it just tears your it's heart brutal. out. It's yeah. so brutal to even have the conversation, and so that's what a big part of why we do what we do. If you do it right, there's never a bad time. If you do it wrong, there's never a good time. It's not entrepreneurship is not about the market. Mm-hmm. It's about you. It's about your organization your education, your mentors, um, your network, um, your capital position. Are you prepared? And do you have the right people in your corner? And if you don't, then you need to find them. Mm -hmm. And you you can't be paralysis analysis. I mean, you can't wait for perfection because perfection doesn't exist. But there's a balance between being properly prepared and being reckless. Mm -hmm. So I'm a firm believer that it's, I don't, I don't believe in outside conditions. I mean, I know they exist. They're real. I mean, look at my shirt. Make your own luck. Make your own luck guys. Don't worry about that outside stuff. You can't control it anyways. Mm -hmm. Focus on the stuff you can control and focus on who's in your network. Who's there to support you who you're hanging around. I quote this all the time. We are a combination of the five people that we spend the most time with. Mm -hmm. That's who you are. So you better be choosing the right people to be hanging around and you better be making sure the wrong people aren't around because they'll bring you down and the right people will bring you up, separating the wheat from the chaff, right? That's it. Yeah. Love it. Uh, Ty was asking about, um, this is kind of all plays in together, but Ty was asking about uh, online reviews and how serious you should take them and should you respond to all of them. I have something to say about that, but what do you have to say? Um, I think you should respond to every one of them. And I think you should respond in kind and diligently to the negative ones. You should Mm -hmm. get the negatives um, five times the time and the thought in your response. Mm -hmm. Because how you respond to the negative reviews, which you will get them, we all get them. Mm -hmm. If you see a business with 400 five-star reviews, it's fake. Something's wrong, yep. They're not perfect. I don't care how great their food is, how beautiful the golf course is. We all make mistakes. And so they're not real. <clears throat> so how, what, if you think about it from a consumer perspective, how do I pick a restaurant? I don't go to the restaurant with 400 five-star reviews because I don't believe it. I go to the restaurant with 400 five-star reviews and 54 star reviews and a handful of threes, twos, and ones because I believe that. But part of my decision-making is how did the owner or operator respond to the negative? Because if they're defensive and they're not professional and they take it personally and they're defensive, then that kind of says something about them that they maybe have an overinflated ego or what have you. So I, I believe it's really important to respond to your reviews. Uh, but I feel, I think it's a lot more important to respond to your negative reviews. And then the last thing I'll say on that is take those to heart and use them as an opportunity to improve your business. Don't mm-hmm. be under the illusion that you're perfect because you're not. Yeah. And I would say too, I mean, I think that's great advice and I, I recommend responding to all reviews too. I do recommend taking a beat before you respond to negative reviews because you yeah. know, the last thing you want is an emotional response um, to a negative review. You want to have a thoughtful response and a calm and collected response because I've seen a lot of business owners respond uh, angrily to negative reviews and it just doesn't come up across very well. Um, so take a, take a breath, calm down a little bit. And what I try to do with negative reviews 
you know, even if there's, I feel like there's not a lot of merit in them. I'm not really speaking to the person who's leaving the review primarily. I'm when I'm writing a response to a negative review, I'm writing the response with everyone else who's going to read this interaction, the review and my response in mind. Um, and so one of the things that I try to do is respond uh, with uh, thanking them for taking the time and addressing their concern. And then what I try to do is I try to include, here's how we're going to be different as a business because of your review. Um, and I try, and that can be really difficult if it's just a review that's just blasting you and it feels unfair, but I try to say, okay, we're going to actually take your review to heart. And because of what you said, we're going to try to do this differently and hopefully it'll be better. Let us know if it's working better or if not, we're always trying to get better. So, you know, keep giving us feedback because we're going to get it right. Um, eventually, essentially. And so, I think customers like to see you be able to take criticism and do something about it. Even if it's not fair, taking the high road and saying, you know, if somebody's like, this store is filthy, blah, 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 or whatever the complaint or the machines don't work or whatever. Um, you know, even if you feel like it's not true, there was dryer sheets on the ground or whatever, um, you know, trying to say, okay, well, here's, you know, I hear what you're saying and here's what I'm going to do because of it to try to, you know, take this issue away. And when other people read that response, they see, okay, here's an owner who cares about their business and wants it to be better. And that's the impression you want to leave with people who are reading reviews. Yeah. Let's go. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Hey, I know we're getting, we're bumping up to it here, but do you have a, do you have any marketing strategies for somebody who's opening a new store? Um, I think it depends on the situation. I mean, when they say opening a new store, I mean, if you're talking pre-construction plans, what I would tell you is to designate some of your budget for grand opening in the first 24 months, because, you know, sometimes it takes a while to get out of the red and into the black where you can have a marketing budget, um, so to speak. So I think it depends on, I think it depends on your capital position, but when you're in the planning phase, don't forget to allocate for marketing. And that's grand opening. A lot of people don't forget that, but they do a grand opening budget and then two months in they're broke. Mm -hmm. So you got to have operating capital, obviously, but um, <clears throat> what I would ultimately tell them is figure out a way to tell the world why you're different. Because mm -hmm. one of the biggest mistakes in marketing, and this applies to existing stores, one of the biggest mistakes I see in marketing is telling people what you are. We're a laundromat. We're at this address. We got 80 pound washers. We got a bathroom. Tell people why you're different. I don't have a bathroom in my Oh, well. See, so if I was your competitor, I would advertise the crap. That <laughs> yeah, I have bathroom. a bathroom. Yeah. Bathroom open. It sounds ridiculous. My whole laundromat's in the bathroom sometimes, so I don't <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but so that's my I mean it's a big picture mentality, but I I recommend a focusing on the the things that are different about you that you're bringing to the industry. Now, if it's a brand new construction and a new building that's never been a laundromat, you do have to do some telling people we're here because they don't know you're there. Mm -hmm. But especially if you're retrofitting a store or something like that, they probably know you're there, but they don't know that you're different. Mm -hmm. So, and then the last thing is I'm in the process of building a new store right now. I'm buying one of my competitors, buying the building, the property. We're going to gut it down to the studs and basically build a brand new, a brand new laundromat. And we've already decided that we're going to do free wash on every machine for two weeks. Mm -hmm. We're still going to charge our normal prices for drying, but free wash every machine, no half off, no dollar double odors, but everything else is regular price. And we're doing it because we want to create a buzz, mm -hmm. but I have it built into my budget. 
So I'm planning for it. Yep. And it's just an expense or an investment, I should say. Yeah. Well, what, what I love, yeah, what I love about that, I mean, there's a guy out here who does that for a month when he opens a new mm-hmm. store for a month, it's free washes. And people are like, you're insane. Like you're going to lose so much money. But when you're either taking over a store and you're trying to increase the business or you're building out a new store, whatever the case may be, when you're trying to acquire new customers, one of the things you're trying to do is you're trying to get people to change their current habits. Cause most likely those people that you're trying to attract to your business are either using another laundromat or they're using the machines at their apartment complex or, or whatever. So what you're trying to do is change their habits. So by doing something, you know, dramatic, like giving free washes for two weeks, that's something that will really snap people out of their current mm-hmm. habits, their current routines yeah. and make them take notice and change those routines. And I think what a lot of people try to do is to do a one-off event where you know, like a grand opening where people will come in, in the droves for that event, but then they kind of trickle out and Mark Mm -hmm. Stern, I think it was Mark Stern who was saying, you know, the magic number is three. You need to get people there three times. And once you get them there three times, uh, then they're your customers, right? So, cause you're developing that routine, you're developing that habit for those, those customers to come to your store to do laundry. So you need to think through, you know, how are you going to get them there three times and doing free washes for two weeks is probably going to do it. Um, but if you're, if you're not going to do that, you know, having a grand opening is awesome, but I think at your grand opening, the goal of that grand opening should be to get them back a second time to your Uh store. The goal of that second visit to your store should be to get them back a third time. And Mm -hmm. once you do that, then you're starting to create a habit. Then you're starting to get traffic. Then you're starting to build a customer base and that is the key to winning over customers. So this guy, you know, here in, in Southern California, who's given away, you know, a month of free washes when he opens a store, what he's doing is creating that routine, creating that habit and building goodwill towards customers, you know, signaling some reciprocity. They're like, well, this guy gave me free washes for a month. So I'm going to keep going to his laundromat. Um, and so, yeah. So when you're thinking about marketing, you know, either opening a new store or taking over a store, your goal should be to get new customers in your doors at least three times. So maybe having a grand opening and then giving them, you know, a free large capacity wash for their next visit coupon. And, you know, the next visit when they turn in that coupon, give them a medium capacity or give them free drive for their next visit or something, give them free soap the next time, something to get them back in the doors again. I know Luke Williford, when he opens a new store with his Freedom uh, Payment Center, they do double your money for, I'm not sure how long. If Luke, if you're still on here, put that in the comments. Um, he does like double your money on the, the mm-hmm. payment system. So if you put 20 bucks and you get 40 and I haven't talked to Luke about this, but I would imagine that he's trying to get them to invest in his business to a point where they're incentivized, but they're also incentivized to return. Because if I put 40 bucks in or 100 bucks in and I got 200 bucks, I'm going to at least make sure I spend that 200 bucks. Mm -hmm. So promotions like that can go a long ways. But guys, we are pretty much out of town time for today. Um, And we just want to thank you guys for being here because the response was kind of overwhelming. And I apologize. We apologize to uh, anyone for any questions we didn't get to. Um, We had decided ahead of time that we were going to do this again. And we're going to do it as long as there's a need, as long as there's people responding Um, and Jordan and I have talked about, um, bringing in other people from the industry to do it with us. So you're not just always getting me and Jordan's opinion. You're getting other people's feedback and opinions in the comments section. You're bouncing ideas off of each other and you're in a situation where, you're hearing and getting feedback from different people. 
because one of the things Jordan said, I think about halfway through this was synopsis wise was to gather as much information as you can learn as much about the industry as you can and then pick and choose what applies to you. And that's what I've done. I suspect that's what Jordan's done. And that's how you start to formulate who you are and what your business looks like and how you operate. Um, so Jordan, any last words? And then if you would tell them when our next um, yeah. event is going to be. Well, I'm, I'm kind of excited because, uh, you know, we have to end this one right now, but we are going to do another one. And I think we need to kick it off with yeah. this question that just came in from Trey, who I say? thought was going one direction with this question. He was asking about new technology in the industry, but he took it way beyond what I thought. And he's like, have you started to think about laundry innovations related to the coming space travel slash tourism industry? And I have not, but I'm going to between now and the next Q and a, cause I definitely want to talk about that. That would be incredible. Pick up um, and delivery on Mars. On Mars. That's what I'm talking about. Oh, All right. So good. That's so we good. can't think too big, Jordan. So between now too and the big. next one, I'm going to give Elon Musk a call and uh, we'll figure out how much it's going to cost me to rent a rocket to shuttle that laundry back and forth until I can get large capacity washers up on Mars. So, um, yeah. No, but we got the next. Thank you again, guys. I mean, I just want to say thank you. Uh, this has been a ton of fun. I've loved like the comment aspect of this is so cool. I want to. I, I want to do more of this uh, because it's so cool talking with you guys through the comments and, and while we're answering, you guys are giving probably even better answers in the comments. So that's just, that's so cool. That's what it's all about. That's why we are doing this stuff. So thank you guys. Um, our next live Q and a, uh, I think we're going to do it on YouTube, right? Um, you'll see yeah. stuff posted about it, but we're going to do it on YouTube next time. Uh, maybe we might be able to do it on both actually. So, you know, stay tuned about that. Uh, but it's going to be January 14th and we're going to try a little bit later in the day, 6 PM Eastern time, 3 PM best coast, West coast time. Uh, and just see how that goes. We're kind of playing around. So if you have feedback on times, days of the week, you know, send those that feedback our way because we do plan on doing more of these. If, you know, as long as people are showing up and having a blast yeah. with us, we're going to do it. So uh, January 14th, 6 PM Eastern, uh, 3 PM Pacific. It'll be the next one. I'm sure you'll see things, uh, posted on our Facebook pages and YouTubes and our websites and all that stuff. So make sure you're checking those things out. Go check out Dave's, uh, uh, YouTube channel, laundromat millionaire, uh, check out laundromat resource, um, check out our websites and, uh, man, can't wait for the next one. Bring those questions and send us questions between now and then, because we'll compile yes. them all and we'll, we'll hit them, especially if you can't make it. Guys, thank you so much for being here. And, uh, you know, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channels because if you choose the alert button and you subscribe, then you're going to get all those notifications and it does help us on YouTube to get some traction. And the more traction that we can get, the more people we can help. So if 500 people know about us in an event like this, then we can help those 500 people. But if 5,000 know, we can help more people. And it's not just about us helping them, but it's us learning from them. Because I can promise you, I learned things today from questions that you asked that Jordan answered or that Brian answered or somebody else on the board answered. And I'm better for that now. And I'm sure that Jordan feels the same way. Definitely. And it's a, it's what this is about. We're trying to build a community. This is not about self promotion, but Jordan and I do have channels, YouTube channels. He's got his podcast, um, Facebook pages, LinkedIn pages, and you can, you know, interact with us there, but you have to, the way these channels are set up, especially YouTube, is you have to subscribe in order to be alerted when there is something new. And so you could go a whole month and there'll be an event going on that we're doing that you want to be a part of, but you don't know about. So, you know, like our Facebook pages 
interact with us because Facebook requires that for you to get the updates. Um, subscribe to our YouTube channels. Um, and uh, thank you. Like, thank you so much for just being a part of this today. And we're going to try to learn between now and January 14th. And who knows? We may even have a special guest. I'm not going to say yeah. we will or we won't, but you give Jordan Barry and Dave Menz six, eight weeks. Oh man. You don't know what you don't know what we're gonna come up with. Yeah. We might have dancing things. monkeys or something. Maybe maybe we'll just bring Elon Musk with us to help Elon us answer Musk. this question. I don't know. We're calling it now. He's gonna be on the next episode. <laughs> so seriously, guys, thank you so much. And Jordan, I can't thank you enough for helping me make this happen because the reality is everybody saw that you were much better <laughs> at balancing the questions and the comments and the answers. I have tunnel vision. So I, I get distracted. <laughs> hey, my <laughs> Thank you for yeah. pulling those questions, dropping them in, because that's not my strong suit. I'm a focus guy. I'm like this. And you're much better at multitasking. So thank you for doing this. Thank you for bringing the value that you bring. Thank you for your heart. Hey, right back at you. And just to let you in on my strategy, it's to just Look for all the hard questions and ask them of you before you ask them of me. That's that's the only <laughs> way I'm doing it. So, yeah. Um, but no, Thanks, thank guys. you. It's been awesome. Thanks, guys. Yep. And we'll see you January 14th, 6 p.m. Eastern time, 3 p.m. Pacific time. Cannot wait. This was so much fun. Can't wait to do it again, guys. See, see you ya. guys. Peace out. <laughs>